An important aspect to analyze in control systems is the stability of a system. In this video, we introduce the concept of stability for discrete time systems and analyze stability in terms of the locations of the system poles. There are several definitions for stability, but in this module we only look at bounded input bounded output stability. Consider a discrete time system described by the transfer function g of z and with input r and output y. The definition for stability states that a system is bounded input bounded output stable if for every bounded input r of k the output of the system is bounded for all time steps. By bounded we mean that we can find a finite value that the signal never exceeds in magnitude. It can be shown that the system is bounded input bounded output stable if and only if the sum of the magnitude of the impulse response for all time steps is finite. Refer to the textbook for its proof. Let's now use this condition to analyze the stability of a system in terms of its transfer function. We start with a system that only has distinct real poles. For such a system we can use partial fraction expansion to write the transfer function as a sum of first order transfer functions where the poles are given by alpha 1 to alpha n. If we apply the inverse z transform to each of these transfer functions, we obtain the impulse response of the system as the sum of exponential components. Let's now look at the time function for one of these exponential components in terms of the location of the pole alpha. If the pole is at zero, the only non-zero value of the impulse response is at time zero which corresponds to an impulse signal. If the pole is between zero and one we have an exponentially decaying signal. If the pole is at one we have a step function. If the pole is greater than one we have an exponentially increasing signal. If the pole is negative then the signal will alternate between positive and negative values Otherwise, the behavior will be the same as for positive poles, exponentially decreasing between 0 and minus 1, constant in magnitude at minus 1, and exponentially increasing for values of the pole smaller than minus 1. If all the poles lie between minus 1 and 1, then all the components will decay to 0. The sum over the magnitude of the impulse response will be finite and the system is therefore stable. However, if at least one pole is more than one in magnitude, then the impulse response will not decay to zero and the sum will be infinite, which means that the system is unstable. Let's now look at the contribution of a complex pole pair to the impulse response. Suppose our system only has one complex pole pair, then we can use partial fraction expansion to write it in this form. Since the pole P and residual A are complex numbers, we can write them in terms of their magnitudes and angles. The impulse response is then the sum of these complex exponential time functions. For the second term, we can equivalently write the complex conjugate of A times the complex conjugate of P to the power K as the complex conjugate of A times P to the power K. The sum of a complex number and its complex conjugate is equal to 2 times its real part, and after we separate the complex numbers into the magnitudes and angles, and combine the angles, we get this line. Lastly, we use Euler's equation to write it as this sinusoidal signal. Its magnitude changes according to r0 to the power k, where r0 is the distance of the pole from the origin of the z-plane. Its frequency is given by omega, which is the angle of the pole in the z-plane. If the distance of the pole from the origin of the z-plane is less than 1, then the resulting impulse response is an exponentially decaying sinusoidal signal. If the distance of the pole from the origin of the z-plane is 1, 
then the impulse response is a sinusoidal signal with a constant amplitude. And if the distance of the pole from the origin is more than 1, then the impulse response is an exponentially increasing sinusoidal signal. A complex pole pair is therefore stable if it lies within the unit circle of the z-plane and unstable if it lies on or outside the unit circle. Although we do not cover it in this video, it can be shown that repeated poles have the same stability properties as distinct poles, meaning that poles within the unit circle are stable and unstable on or outside the unit circle. By using the reasoning of the first page, we can put everything together and say that a system is stable if all its poles lie within the unit circle in the z-plane and it is unstable if at least one pole lies on or outside the unit circle.